some of the areas that God began to prepare my heart for heaven. You know, there's got to be a preparation to go to heaven. You, you would not be comfortable in heaven if you did not have some preparation. The, one of the uh, men the, that I just made reference to, Sadhu Sundar Singh, called the, the disciple of bleeding feet in India, had this vision, and I, I've never forgotten it. I really appreciated it. He saw the death of a philosopher, the death of a drunkard, and the death of a child. And he said, the philosopher, he said, the, the angels of the Lord came and bore the child away when the child died. And the child went to heaven. The drunkard went to hell. He did not know Jesus. He had not been born again. The philosopher had said in the vision to the missionary when he tried to witness to him, I will take my chances. You tell me that this God is a God of love. If he is truly a God of love, then he wouldn't send anybody to hell. So I won't repent. I don't need to go through this ritual of born again, so forget it. And then he died. As he died, he was plunging down into the abyss, and he screamed out. And uh, Sadhu said in his ears he could hear the, the ringing of his voice as he screamed out and said, I knew there's no God of love, for if there was a God of love, I wouldn't be going to this awful place. When all of a sudden, a voice spoke from the heavens above, and two angels came down like lightning and caught him and brought him up, as the voice said, bring him up here. And he was set in front of these beautiful gates. And the gates opened. And Sadhu said, I was inside, and I looked at him as the gates opened, and I saw his face. As all of a sudden, his face lit up, and this look of expression on his face, see, I told you I wouldn't need to repent, as he ran into the gates of heaven. But the moment he got inside, he began to crouch down, covering his eyes and looking around and, and trying to say, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. Where's the gates? Let me out of here. I'm not ready for this holy place. It's too pure. I can't stand it. And he made his way, stumbling and ran out the gates and plunged off into hell, screaming, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. I'm not ready for this holy place. That taught me something very valuable. Many people say to me, if God is a God of love, then why would he create such a horrible place as hell? I say to you, the word of God says it was never made for anyone in mankind. It was made for the devil and his angels. But if you take sides with him, then you have chosen his allotment. Well, then, does God send people to hell? No. They couldn't stand heaven just as that man. If he allowed them to come into heaven, they would want to leave just as that philosopher did, and they would flee from the holy presence of God because their uncleanness would not be comfortable in the presence of pureness and holiness. And that's what we want to get into and talk about and help you to understand about heaven. But first, I want to begin by testifying to you the first experience that I had going into the heavens. And as uh, Stan gave the introduction regarding the man that he knew that was caught up into the third heaven or fourth heaven. I forget which one it was. Now, fourth heaven. All right. There are many levels of heaven. You realize that uh, uh, in descriptive wise, heaven begins six inches above your head. <laughs> All right. So there are heavens, right? And in Corinthians, it speaks of the different levels of heavens, of the celestial, the terrestrial, and all of these realms. So I want to talk to you more of the area in my first trip to heaven about the celestial heaven. And I believe that is the realm in which we see the planets, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the planets, and uh, the solar systems out there that we can't identify yet. Some of them we call the area of the Milky Way, of which they believe there could be hundreds of thousands of solar systems in the Milky Way. So in that experience, I had to die to have it. <laughs> And it wasn't a pleasant experience. I, I have to tell it to you this way. My wife killed me. <laughs> I could ask you for a show of hands, but I won't. 
When I go, went to Japan the first time and was speaking before a, a large group of people uh, across from the emperor's palace in Tokyo, I said, how many men here have a wife that killed them? And the interpreter shot off the interpretation. Why, I thought I was going to lose half the congregation right there, or half the group of people. They looked at me with such shock. I says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me explain that. <laughs> Lest you think that in America we are totally violent people. <laughs> it was in an, in an automobile accident. And uh, she didn't mean to. She loves me too much. But uh, she was a vital part of getting me back to life again, too, okay? It's one thing to have a wife that can kill you. It's another thing to have one that can believe God to resurrect you, all right? <laughs> we were in a van, my wife and I, and eight of our children. And I won't give all the details. I don't have time. I have many materials I want to get into, so I'll just scan quickly across the situation of the accident. But except to say that that night I had been driving all night long, our eldest daughter had given to me for Father's Day a tape by the Gaithers called Fully Alive. And uh, this will help you to date it back in 1984, I think is how long ago this happened. Yes, 1984, Father's Day. Isn't it wonderful to go to heaven on Father's Day? God does all things in order, you know. <laughs> I was on my way to see the Father on Father's Day. Well, I had driven all night and was getting that just dawning time when it is so difficult to stay awake. And so I pulled off the highway up in the mountains of Northern California, the big mountains, and said, honey, uh, my head is dropping and uh, I don't want to go off the cliff. If you will just simply uh, drive for an hour, I'll be refreshed and uh, I'll be able to go on for four or five more hours and you can have some more sleep because she had worked for a straight 24 hours getting eight children ready and uh, her and I to go down to Phoenix, Arizona from Portland, Oregon for a wedding, our second daughter's wedding. Well, she took the wheel and I crawled in the seat behind her, which was a full seat. The front was a full seat. Our 10-year-old was at her right hand up front and she was driving. She had the headphones on. She wasn't buckled in. She has always hated seat buckles and thinks it's an infringement upon her rights of free moral agency and choice. Uh, <laughs> we won't get into that. Anyhow, that's my wife's politics. We'll stay away from it. But it wasn't a law yet that you had to be seat belted uh, in Oregon at that time. We understood later it was in California. But uh, none of us were buckled in. Obviously, how do you buckle up when you're laying across the, se the, the seat sleeping? So I wasn't buckled in. It'd be very uncomfortable trying to strap yourself in. But I wouldn't have been planning this anyhow. None of you would have planned what I went through. You just don't make plans for those things. They happen. But um, I got into the deepest sleep because I was sleeping so good. Right behind me was three of our, our boys. And then in the very back of this 1970 Volkswagen, laying on blankets and pillows, were four of our youngest children. And uh, all of a sudden, I was awakened with her crying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Now, we always do that anytime there's an emergency or any sudden fear. She had just flown from Portland back not long ago, just before we went to England, and uh, they hit into some turbulence. She had been going quite long hours with the grandchildren and visiting and was tired. And so she was asleep on the plane as it hit some turbulence. She was awakened by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus coming out of her own lips. She heard the sound of her own voice in her ears. And in her sound sleep, she was saying the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And she shook herself awake and looked at the man sitting in the seat beside her. And he was kind of giving her the strangest looks. And, <laughs> and she said she just kind of smiled at him and he kind of grinned at her. And she said, I thought, well, I think I better go back to sleep. And <laughs> so this is how heavily program this is in my wife and, and me. Uh, any emergency, the slightest thought of a deer coming in the road, a bird or, or any animal or any person looking like they're going to come out in front of me, the blood of Jesus is the first thing I think. Why? Why? Ephesians chapter 2, you're a far ways off from heaven, aren't you? But you're drawn nigh that quick through the blood of Jesus. We're drawn to the throne through the blood of Jesus. And if you want your petitions known instantly, it's through the blood. So she was crying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And something was banging under the van. And I couldn't figure what it was. And I was trying to get out of this sound sleep. 
and I made myself sit up trying to get my eyes open. And uh, she's always said, well, honey, if you'd have just stayed laying down and praying, you wouldn't have got killed. <laughs> and I says, well, dear, what man on the face of the earth would stay laying down when his wife is crying loudly the blood of Jesus and something is banging under the van real hard? I had to get up and the van is leaning dangerously while well, she'd gone off all four tires off the road trying to get the headphone wires that were plugged into the dash that our 10-year-old had got his feet tangled up into the emergency brake and the gear shift. So she was over here trying to untangle them. And my wife, when she does something, it doesn't matter if she's picking something up or what, she automatically does this. Well, what does that do? That takes you off the road. I tell her, when you do that, if the road is straight, rest your elbow on the side of the, the armrest so you know you're still, you know, basically going that way and you're going straight and then reach over and get it and you're still on the road in the right lane. But it's all right. <laughs> My children, after she did some spins on black ice one night and jumped this big ditch and landed in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska. <laughs> Now, believe me, I'm not running my wife down. If she was here, she'd be laughing harder than you because she knows what I'm saying is the truth and it's not critical. It's just explanatory, all right? <laughs> but they jumped this big ditch, which a travel home shortly before uh, had went down into and, and literally blew all tires on the thing. They had to tow it out with a big wrecker. She jumped this ditch and landed in the middle of the cornfield and the car was still running. She looked around and she says, well, get out and see if there's any flat tires. David got out and went around, come back and sit in and said, well, no, mom, there's no flat tires. So she said, well, let's head for that farmhouse. That's the only lights I see. We can't go back through this big ditch. So she drove across the cornfield and come in the backyard by the barn of the farmer <laughs> who had just finished with his big tractor, putting it in the barn and was coming out of the barn from pulling the big travel home out so that the wrecker could haul the travel home away. <laughs> and she said, he, he gave her the funniest look when she came by the barn. So she stopped and he said, what are you, there's no roads back there. <laughs> what are you doing back there? Well, I just hit some ice out on the highway and spun and jumped. Not that ditch. Yes. <laughs> you jump that ditch. Do you know how wide it is? Well, anyhow, as they finally get out on the highway and she is going about 10 mile an hour over this same area again, mind you, because she's going to make sure she doesn't do this again. She overhears David in the back saying to the others, comforting them. David is 14 at that point. He was 10 when this, this accident I'm going to talk about in a minute occurred. He says to the others, he says, well, you know, it's all right, I guess, to have a mom that doesn't know how to drive <laughs> as long as she knows how to pray. <laughs> so... I think that describes my wife the best. <laughs> she does not claim to be an expert driver, but she does know about prayer. So she was crying the blood of Jesus, and I set up when all of a sudden a chunk of that asphalt that was breaking off where she was trying to get the tire back up on the pavement, it didn't give. And when that happened, the rubber of that tire, that tire turned like this, spinning the wheel, throwing her over against David. We were already leaning, and it put the van around like that, throwing her over against David on the other side of the van, and we went careening across the highway on two wheels. Well, there's a big, there was a big black question mark about this long on that highway afterwards that I saw, and I think the question mark meant, do you really want to do this? Because when she grabbed the steering wheel and pulled to get behind the wheel, it took the rubber of that tire that was leaning like this going along and forced it into the asphalt, causing the van to do a complete endo. It did a complete flip around and came upside down on its top. And we skidded exactly right straight down the white line, leaving orange and white paint on both sides. Well, that was the situation, but above my head was the car top carrier loaded with all the luggage of 10 people for 10 days, for wedding, for play clothes, for the children, 
for casual clothes for mom and dad. And some things for the couple that's getting married, our daughter. When you take the force of a van and you bring it all down on top of that, something's got to give. Yes, the luggage gave and all the suitcases got crushed and strewn 300 feet, about 260 feet down the highway. But the roof gave too. Well, I had just set up and wouldn't you know it was above me and I'm the tallest one of the family at this point. And so the roof comes down on me. And from the hole in the roof and the blood where my head had a hole in it, the pieces that come through from the car top carrier, nailing me into that van, pressing me into the seat, I only felt pain briefly. There's a song that I so appreciate. It's an old one you may remember. It only hurts for a little while. (laughs) That's what they tell me. That's what they say. I am a testimony of that. And I say this to really be an encouragement to some of you that have or may someday lose a loved one in a terrible accident where their bodies are brutalized. When your body is injured to the maze your mind was, you leave your body that fast. It doesn't even hurt a little while. It's gone. I didn't feel the pain from my head to my toes more than three times, and it moved quickly. But what I left my body. As I left my body, I could hear the van going on. It was like I was left behind. The van was going on. I can still hear the crunching of that metal, the the terrible, loud, grinding sound of of the car top carrying all that under the van. And it's, it's just grinding up and spewing out from under the thing as the top is grinding away. The front windshield blew out. The back hatch blew open. The four children in the back should have been slung out of that thing like a catapult. Yet the witnesses said they still laid upside down on their pillows and blankets. Their blankets didn't even fall down toward the roof. Now they were upside down. The back hatch was all the way open, scraping the highway. Not one of them fell down. Not one of our children fell down in the seat. The 15-year-old directly behind me said, I looked at you, Dad, and you were pushing like this, and then you kind of relaxed. I looked out the window, and I thought, those aren't clouds going by. That's the white line, for we had begun to skid toward the other side of the road. And she said, I realized, we're upside down, and I'm not even buckled in, and I'm not falling. And she said, I looked down because I thought I felt like a buckle around me holding me in. And there was no buckle but but holding me. I looked at my two brothers on the left, and neither one of them were falling down. I looked then in the back, remembering the four little ones in the back. And there they were, except for Mark, the oldest of the four. He had hold of the, 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 the back of the seat like this and was looking with pretty good-sized eyes, he said. <laughs> but the other three were still laying on their pillows asleep, upside down and not falling. Mark should have fallen right on the roof. He didn't even fall on the roof. But when I left my body, I could hear the sound of that metal crunching and all. And the last thing I heard was the cry of my wife as I heard one final crunch. It was when the the van turned slowly going the other side of the highway and hit a big boulder on the other side of the highway. And it flipped that van in the air so violently that all the witnesses said they just knew it was going to go down the grade and disintegrate. Instead, they said, it's like it flipped up only enough to bring it on upright where the wheels were coming down. And then it came down like a feather in slow motion and landed on all four wheels and didn't even roll down the grade. I didn't know that. The last thing I heard was, oh, Lord, we're going over. Well, in my mind, what do you mean your mind? You were dead, Henry. Yes. Let me tell you something about death. When you die, And you leave your body, you have more of a body than you do in your body. Now, that may be hard for you to believe, but I want to tell you something. I was in my youth out of my body. I'm not in it in my body. I do a lot of walking. I get tired. I get weary. I have aches and pains. I get blisters once in a while. That body I was in, I don't think could have qualified for any of those. 
But as the last thing I heard was, oh, Lord, we're going over. And then very quickly, I entered into what I call the tunnel. And the reason I call it a tunnel is because if I were to take any of you, put you in a convertible or just a, a car and roll the windows down and blindfold you and go down the highway and say to you, tell me when we enter a tunnel. You could tell me the instant. How? Because the sound of the vehicle would come into the vehicle, wouldn't it? It would go up against the walls of the tunnel and come back. That's the reason I call it a tunnel, because it was the sensation of a tunnel. The sound of my being, the, the second it entered that realm, sounded like I, it reminded me of the sensation of entering a tunnel. However, when I entered that, it was a total change from outside that tunnel. Because inside the tunnel, there was a darkness in there that I say was so dark and so heavy, you could have cut it with a knife. I had never in my life experienced that form of a darkness. In the book of Exodus, the Lord put a darkness, a thick, heavy darkness between the Hebrews camping out there on that peninsula by the Red Sea and the Egyptians. That it says they wandered around and they couldn't even find hardly their hands in front of their face. That's the kind of a darkness it was. I knew I had a body. I knew I was in a sitting position, but I was in a darkness I had never experienced in my life. As I was going backwards, I didn't know at the time I was going backwards, but all of a sudden I heard a voice behind me and the voice said, turn around, the light is here. You know what I did? I wouldn't turn around. I said, no. I want to go back. My family's hurt. They need me. Then the silence of just that sound like a tunnel again. And I was listening. The reason I think my sense of hearing was so keen was because I was listening with everything within me, trying to hear a whimper, a cry, trying to hear some form of evidence that some of my family had survived that terrible accident. Because when I had turned the wheel over to my mother and my wife, we were in big enough mountains that if we would have went off the highway anywhere, it would be all over. If you've ever traveled in the northern mountains of California, you'll know what I mean. They are big mountains, and you can plunge down thousands of feet very quickly. And there's not much left when you get to the bottom. Silence again. I'm concentrating. I'm in a sitting position. My elbows are on my knees, so I assume that I am sitting, leaning forward, concentrating, trying to hear some evidence of life. When again, the voice speaks to me a second time, and it says with a greater urgency, turn around, the light is here. And again, I said, no, I want to go back. My family's hurt. They need me. Now, I had no idea the power of the human will. I had no idea that out of my body, I had a choice. This was a revelation to me. The voice did not continue to persist. Only the sound of this tunnel sensation. When after that, all of a sudden, I burst out of that tunnel like being shot out of a cannon. And as I burst out of it, the earth was right in front of me. It's like I was burst, shot out of it, sitting down, going backwards to where I could see the earth. And you know how they zoom in on the earth from a globe? They zoom in on it. Well, that's the way it was. In my total peripheral vision, I could see nothing but the world. And all of a sudden, the world was just doing this, getting smaller and smaller that fast. Till it went down to about a baseball size in, in my perspective of what I was looking at. And I passed the moon. I looked over at the moon and I said to myself, that's the moon. I've seen many pictures of that. That's what the dark side looks like. And I was thoroughly enjoying the moon. But the moon then was getting smaller and smaller. And then I another planet and another planet went by me. One went by me below. One went by me on the left. And I'm looking at these planets and I look back at the earth. And the earth all of a sudden is about the size of a marble. That quick. It has become that small. I can see the moon, but I can see these planets, but I can barely discern the earth. The last time I looked back at the earth, all I could see was a little sparkle, looked like a BB. That small. 
I knew for some reason in my spirit, I knew it was the earth. It's like I could look at my pattern like you go down a highway and if you look down a long straight road in the periphery of the highway, you remember certain landmarks. I remember the certain orientation of the planets I had been passing. And as I looked at the earth and thought, my goodness, I'm a long ways from home. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, as I'm looking back that way, I burst into what I call the Milky Way. Now, I, I, I don't have the earth language to explain to you. I don't have the vocabulary. I, I, I can't put it in words what I, what I experienced when I burst into the Milky Way because obviously it was something that I had never seen up close before. Has anybody here seen the Milky Way up close? <laughs> The only way I can explain it to you is, is a feeble attempt, believe me. But it's like when we were kids, we'd sit in the station wagon dad had in the back seat and it had a reverse seat in it. You sit in it and three of us would, uh, brothers would sit back there and we would cup our hands like this along our face so we couldn't see the terrain alongside in the desert as we went down the pavement. And as we went down the, the blacktop or pavement, we would try to guess at what second we would go off the pavement onto the dust road. Because the second you go on the dust road, you know it because the swirling of the dust comes up and hits the window and all these particles of dust are just hitting the back window and then they begin to accumulate and fall down. You know what I mean? So we'd play the game. Who can guess the most accurate when we're going to hit the dust? And, of course, the one that guessed just as we hit it always won. So we play games like this. Children always play games like that to, you know, entertain themselves. But the reason I use that, that analogy is because it was a sensation similar to that in the sense that when this, when these, all of a sudden the clouds, the, the, the Milky Way didn't swirl like clouds in front of me, but they were so numerous. The planets were so numerous, I could not do like I had been doing before I entered it. Before I entered it, I could distinguish each and every planet I passed and see beautifully the size and the character of them. Now, all of a sudden, there were so many, all I could do was try to focus in on one, but it would be left behind so fast. But I could focus in only long enough to see that it had different characteristics from the previous one I had just looked at. So here I am. I'm looking all around at all of these beautiful, sparkling planets that I am passing so numerous and so fast. And I've completely forgotten about home. I've completely forgotten about my family. My mind isn't on them anymore. I am just totally entertained by all of these beautiful, beautiful heavenly bodies. And I was thoroughly enjoying that when all of a sudden, back on the ground, they had been doing CPR on me. Or you see, when the van came down and stopped on all fours, the 10-year-old boy up front couldn't get his door open, so he crawled out through where the shattered windshield was, where the windshield was. And he crawled out and he came around and he said, I come out around the, the side of the van just in time to see you, dad, to see you forcing the sliding door open. And he said, you stepped out, your hands were hanging down. And he said, dad, I looked into your eyes and your face and you weren't there. Now that's a 10 year old description of death. You weren't there. And he said, you no more than stood on your feet and you fell over backwards and bounced and you didn't move. And he said, there was blood running down your face, but that wasn't even coming out of your head anymore where it had come out. And then these people ran up and they were feeling your neck and your wrists and feeling in front of your face. And they started pushing on your chest and blowing in your mouth. Well, they were doing CPR, of course. 
They didn't do that too long because the more they pumped on my chest and went to blow on my mouth, the more the blood shot out of the hole. And the more the blood, when they plugged the hole, it shot out of my nose and my mouth. So they realized that I had been crushed to such a degree that the blood was just going through all ports of my head. And the forest ranger, who was one of the men doing the CPR, said, he told me later, he said, I looked at your children. I looked at you. And he said, if I would have thought there was one ounce of hope, I would have kept doing CPR till I died. I was determined to get you back. But he said, I couldn't believe enough to believe that I could get you back with that fatal of an injury. I looked at the other two that were assisting me and shook my head and said, the injuries are too massive. It won't do any good. So they quit. But when they quit, our 15-year-old daughter that said she'd seen my, couldn't see my head as it was rammed down on my shoulders and saw my hands, the level of my shoulders, trembling for a second, then relax. When they looked at each other and gave up and shook their heads, she ran around to the other side of the van where my wife had been taking the, the little ones out of the back and she had been praying over each of them so they wouldn't go into shock. And as we pray, always in a situation of emergency or a possible injury, we always pray for no ill effects. And so she was monitoring them very closely and she assumed that I was taking care of the older ones on the other side and there were no serious emergencies. She heard people talking over there, but uh, she just figured that we were talking about the accident. But then the 15-year-old, when they said it's no use, she screamed running around to Judith my wife, and she grabbed her and began to pray and rebuke this, this panic and this, this shock that was coming over. This is what she thought. And then Cheryl, our daughter, wrenched herself out of her arms, running back around. And she kind of started to follow her to make sure she was all right. When all of a sudden, before she got around the van, she heard Cheryl saying these words, devil, that's my daddy. Death, you can't have him. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And at that, Judith said, that's my Henry. And she said, I hasten my step and come around and joined in with Cheryl agreeing. Well, then I came back into my body. I came back out of what I call the Milky Way and came back into a body that couldn't feel anything from my temples down. I could feel blood running like, it felt like it was running in my eyes, but I didn't realize it was running behind my eyes. But I couldn't feel it go any farther. I could feel nothing down. I could feel my eyelids blinking. I could hear very well. I heard a person say, he's breathing. I heard another person say, he's got pulse. A man said one and a woman said the other. And then I heard someone running. And I heard a two-way radio. Shall we dispatch an ambulance? And then I heard this man's voice saying, can you hold on that? The woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. And I asked him later what that meant and why he said that. And I hope to explain that to you. Well, the essence is he had called out an ambulance two days before and people were killed on the pass just up above us in the mountains when the ambulance head on into another vehicle that was passing. And there were two people killed in that. And he came on that scene. He called another ambulance out. And that ambulance got into an accident and the attendant was killed. And he said, I wasn't about to do it again. I was not going to risk the life of more people to call them out for a dead man. And uh, so I had this problem. I could feel my eyelids blinking, but I couldn't see. I was blind. I could hear very well. But when he said this words, he said, can you hold on that? The woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. It was like a balloon of faith exploded in my being. And I said to myself, there is no reason for me to go to the hospital. I'm going to that wedding. Father, whatever is missing on me, you can put it back together. 
And I meant it with all of my heart. And then as that ha- I prayed that, it was like two cutting torches. One hit me in each temple. and Boy, were they hot. And that heat started going down. And as that heat was going down, my vision began to come in. And here was like three, four, five identical twins of this lady right in front of me, leaning over me, pushing on my chest. I didn't know she was. I couldn't feel it yet. But she was leaning over. And she was saying, don't move. You're hurt. We're going to get help. Well, with that, then I heard the man running again, who was the forest ranger, because they'd said he's breathing. He come over. Then he headed back to go get the ambulance there then. And so with that, the fire went down. And as the fire went down, I began to feel my body and wanted to get up. And I wanted, started to get up, and I could hear the man on the radio trying to say, we need an ambulance quick. And uh, so he just got him on, and I said, I want to get up. And she grabbed me, and she says, don't move your head. Your neck could be broken. Your head's been banged up. And she's pushing on my chest and holding my chin. And I said, I'm all right. I'm all right. I want to get up. And she says, please don't move. And I says, I'm okay. I want to get up. So she's one that, like me, can't talk without her hands. She let go of my chin and she says, what are we going to do? He says he's all right. He wants to get up. And with that, she turned her head. So I looked and turned my head in the direction she was looking. And I said, I'm all right. I want to get up. And about that time, the two-way radio said, go ahead. And the man's looking at the microphone in his hand. He's looking at me. And I'm saying, I'm all right. I want to get up. And he says, Oh, 10 4 out. Let him up. I could believe anything at this point. <laughs> Isn't Jesus wonderful? Yeah. How many in the world that believe in Buddha or Muhammad or the Shintos or the Hindi religions, how many have you ever met that talk about a death experience like I've been talking about and have come back to talk about it? I haven't met a one yet. And in my introduction, it was said that I have worked and ministered with over 70 countries of the earth. That's the truth. And I have met many of these people, ministered among thousands of them. And I have yet to have one tell me about the death experience and returning from death. When I was preaching over in Tokyo in the crusade, they had advertised all over Tokyo that I would be there across from the emperor's palace in the big uh, conference center, ministering on the four-day weekend, the biggest holiday weekend in Japan. And uh, God was good to me. He gave me an expert interpreter. Now, in Japan, the number one paid professors or teachers in Japan are those that can teach American English. The highest paid professor in Japan, above all your other realms, is a Japanese professor that is on television every day across Japan, and he teaches American English. Why? Because they want to learn English the way the Americans speak it. So I was preaching away with this interpreter that uh, his name is David Matsumoto. If I pronounce it properly, I'm not. I'm not any good in Japanese. That's why I need an interpreter. But he is the interpreter that uh, Billy Graham chose for his crusades and uh, is an excellent interpreter. I mean, when you are preaching and you cut loose, I mean, he goes the same gestures and everything. I mean, the second you shut down, he's going. So I was going at it that first morning of the conference and ministering with all these Japanese people. And I said this word and I said, and when I went to heaven, (laughs) <laughs> like this, and my voice just echoed through the, this, the, the facilities. And all of a sudden, there's a tap on my shoulder. He didn't go on with the Japanese of that. And I look over, and he says, uh, brother, brother, uh, wait a minute. Uh, this was a dream, wasn't it? I said, no, I went to heaven. He said, you went to heaven? I said, yes. He says, go for it. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So I went for it, you know, and uh, the anointing of God was there to just really go at it and preach. And I was preaching away. And then the Holy Spirit said, now give the altar call. I thought, Lord, I, that was a short sermon. 
you know, and me, I, I'm not accustomed to that. <laughs> all right. So I give the altar call. And all of these Japanese people come running forward, tears streaming down their faces. You do not normally see Japanese people with tears in public places. It was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We were having uh, lunch afterwards in a restaurant, and I asked uh, my interpreter, David, I said, David, why did you stop me and, uh, and say this was a dream, wasn't it? And what's the significance of that? Why did you say go for it? He says, Henry, you obviously don't understand. He said, being Japanese myself and understanding the Buddhist religion, they believe in heaven. However, to this date, there has never been a Buddhist that has gone to heaven and come back to testify about it. And he said, I knew the moment you had this testimony. I'd never interpreted for anybody that had been to heaven. And that's why I got excited. And he said, you see, I knew we had advertised this crusade all over Tokyo. And I knew that there would be all of these Buddhist people coming because we had stated it would be three sessions a day, a minimum of two hours per session on a free will offering basis. He said, The Japanese people will pay tens of thousands of dollars for lessons in English. And I am known all over Japan. And he says, I don't mean that boastfully. It's just I am as an expert interpreter. And here you are speaking American English. And he interprets. So they get three two-hour sessions, four days on a free will offering basis. English lessons. But he said, when you mentioned, when you went to heaven and said you had been to heaven, he says, my heart started pounding because I knew the spirit of God was going to bring a harvest. Now, he said, will you do me a favor? This afternoon session, this evening session, the next three days, would you in every session give a portion on heaven? I said, I sure will. Every session we had souls coming forward, giving their hearts to the Lord. And he said, as he went down and prayed with them and talked to them, they were Buddhist people giving their hearts to Jesus. So you see the power of the message on heaven. And it is a powerful message. Now, I want to clarify something that I, I not clarify or just clear up something for you. Remember, I had told you that I was in the tunnel. And I heard a voice behind me that said, turn around. The light is here. Now. Twelve days after the accident, I uh, I had gotten back home. The wedding was over. We got back home, and it was a Saturday morning. I sat up in bed, and I didn't tell my family up to that time that I had died, and I didn't tell them what I experienced when I died. They told me what they saw, but I couldn't tell them I died because I was afraid to, because I was really wrestling. I thought that I had denied the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, mind you, I've been walking with the Lord at that time for many years, at least 25, 28 years. And uh, I, I thought I had refused the voice of the Lord two times. So I began to be depressed. And that Saturday morning, I sat up in bed, and I just couldn't take it anymore. And as I sat up in bed, it just began to all break loose, and I began to weep. My wife sat right up, and she said, honey, what is the matter? And I said, I I can't take it anymore. I feel like I have refused the Lord. I've grieved the Holy Spirit. And she says, why, Henry, what did you do? (laughs) I imagine... Her poor mind thinking, oh, no, you know, with all the reports we have of things, ministers getting into things nowadays. I've never asked her what she thought when she said that. But the alarm of her voice told me that she couldn't imagine what I had done. And I started telling her what had happened in the tunnel and told her how I left my body. And that was the first I had told it in that since the accident of the tunnel experience and all. and. So, as I was telling it, 
I no more than finished the part of refusing the voice the second time. And I said, it was the sweetest voice I've ever heard. And she said, as my wife can do, she said, why, Henry Groover, you know better than that. You know the word of God says Satan has transformed himself as an angel of light. And you know the word of God says my sheep know my voice and another's will they not hear. And when she said that, it was like chains broke off of my spirit. The depression left and I understood that it was not the voice of my Lord, but it was the voice of the deceiver trying to get me to turn around and forfeit the will to live and not make the petition. No, I want to go back. My family's hurt. They need me. You see, I made that petition two times in the face of all odds. And that set my will in solid motion. And the father honored that will. So I wanted to clarify that and help you to understand that. A year later, I was down in West Phoenix at uh, Skyway Baptist Church. And uh, uh, there were about 250 people there that night. And uh, I had been asked to preach an evangelistic sermon. Baptists love evangelistic sermons. And so do I. And so I was about 15 minutes into preaching this evangelistic sermon. My mind was nowhere on anything of the accident or anything about heaven. It was regarding souls. And I was preaching away when all of a sudden it was as though the Lord, I sensed his presence coming real close and real strong. I kind of paused like this and it was like the Lord just nudged up beside me and whispered in my ear these words. He said, I thought I might just let you pass through the heavens and show them to you before I roll them up as a scroll and toss them aside. When he spoke that to me right in front of those dear Baptist people, I got emotional. The tears, I couldn't hold them. They just shot out. I couldn't talk, believe it or not. I couldn't. <laughs> I was crying so hard. All I could say is, I'm sorry. Leaning against the podium. I'm sorry. And I was sobbing. And as I started to say, I'm sorry, I saw this vision. And in the vision, I saw myself as a seven-year-old little boy. Back when I was seven years old, had been in the Sunday school class. This literally happened to me. And the Sunday school teacher had taught on those very scriptures about how Jesus, how the Lord, he used, she used Jesus, how he formed the worlds by the works of his fingers and tossed them out there, the works of his hands into the heavens. And the day is coming when he will roll them up as a scroll and toss them aside and create a whole new heaven and new earth. And what I did back in those days, that so shook me and so stirred me. Now, only the father understands these things. He knew the day was coming that he would fulfill this petition. I came home from Sunday school church that afternoon and mother was preparing dinner. I got dressed in my little cutoffs and uh, went out in my play clothes there in Arizona and went out to play. But uh, my brothers and sister went out to play too, but I really wasn't wanting to play. I wanted to get away and alone by myself. I just wanted to tuck away somewhere where none of the family would see me. There were too many of us boys in the bedroom. I couldn't do it there. So I went outside in the backyard, crawled down in the gravel underneath dad's camping trailer, crawled under it and propped my elbows up on the axle Back in behind the big wheel of the camping trailer where nobody would see me and I propping my elbows on this axle, I was praying these words. Dear Jesus, when you roll the heavens up and toss them aside, can I be beside you and see how you do it? And can I stay beside you and watch you make new heaven and a new earth and put them in place, I would like to see you throw them out there and see how they stay. And the vision he showed me was exactly that. 
In the vision, it was so real, I could feel the gravel on my knees. I could feel the elbows touching the axle and myself crouching down. I could hear my little seven-year-old voice bringing that petition before the Lord. And I'll tell you, that really made me break. I stood there and I couldn't say a word. I just cried and cried and cried. Pretty soon, people all over the congregation started crying. I wasn't preaching anything, but they were crying. The next thing I knew, through my tears, they started running forward, and the altar was full of people, and they were crying. Some were repenting, some were rejoicing. Some were saying, I want to know Jesus better. I want to know you better. And they were getting close to Jesus. About two hours later, I finally was able to just explain to them what had happened. Then I, I finished in prayer and some hands went up and said, could I say something? And one after the other said that they too, the reason they ran to the altar, they felt like Jesus came in the door and sit down and snuggled up beside them. And they just felt so loved and the presence of the Lord so precious. Well, that was a precious experience. And it gave me a better understanding why the Lord allowed me to pass through the heavens so that he could show them to me before he rolls them up as a scroll. Because he's going to do that one day. And they are getting old now. and We're hearing all kinds of report, reports about fragmentations of their falling apart hitting us here on the earth and all kinds of things. But don't worry, nowhere in the scripture does it say that he's going to destroy the earth with an asteroid. Do you remember that? <laughs> all right, I want to go on. I want to talk about the other side. On beyond where I was when I came back from the Milky Way. This experience took place on October the 22nd, 1988. I had just come back from walking and praying over in Europe. And uh, before I went on that trip, I had gone across and around the cities of Portland, Oregon, where we lived at that time. We live in Woodbine, Iowa now, but I had went out and walked in and had taught and ministered in churches all around the general Portland area. And, uh, I, every place I would go, I would ask the elderly people, how many here have aching bones? And I would ask for a show of hands. Well, then when they would raise their hands, I would say to them, would you make a covenant with me? I need intercessors. I need prayer warriors. I'm going to be heading out and I'm going to be walking the path of the crusades. And there's a lot of bloodshed across these Euro eight, eight different European countries. And I've got a lot of work to do, and it's not going to be easy, and I want to get it done as quickly as possible. Will you covenant with me that when your bones are aching and you can't sleep, that you'll remember Henry Groover wherever he is, that you'll pray for him and his family at home, because the enemy hates my family at home too, and does everything he can to try to get me to have to come back home. And so I had many elderly people of all different ages, men and women, that covenanted that they would intercede and pray for me. Well, there was a special group of about 25 in the immediate circle of the Portland area that really were faithful in this. And so when I came back, we sent out invitations to these and uh, asked them to come to a special meeting of which I would be giving a report because many of them had called my wife and had said, something's going on with Henry. And she would mark the time, the day and the hour. And then when she would talk to me, she'd say, what happened in this time? And I would explain, and it was a direct confirmation that they were hearing from God. And believe me, in warfare, in the realms of spiritual warfare, there is nothing more important than being backed up with intercessors. And uh, I really appreciate the prayers of older people that have walked with the Lord for many years. And I can assure you that many testimonies we have from these people that as they begin to be faithful to intercede for me, all of a sudden they realize their bones weren't aching anymore. And yet they had a burden for me. And God would take away their aching bones. 
but they realized the value of prayer. And so I had coverage of prayer from many ways. So here we were in this meeting by invitation of the intercessors. And while I was gone on that trip, my wife received a new song from the Lord. The Lord has given her about two hours of scripture songs. She plays an auto harp or piano, and she sings these songs. And they've been a blessing to people all over the world. She's been with me on many trips, and uh, we've sang to many countries of the earth. And uh, she's been with me five, uh, four trips now to Japan. She's been with me, and God has given her songs for the people of Japan, and it ministers to them. But the Lord had given her a new song while I was gone, and it fit perfectly and theologically into the battles that I fought and the scriptures the Lord kept giving me. Here he gives her a song back home from those scriptures. And that's, God works with us uh, in many ways that way. My wife and I, we're a, we're a real team in the Lord. And we have great respect for one another in, in the way God uses us. And uh, this respect has taught us to, to keep ourselves for one another pure before the Lord. And so that God can use us together. So no wedge can get between us. And I can assure you that for many years, I would not go to a foreign city until the Lord had spoken to my wife, the name of the city and the country secretly. I would never tell anybody where I was going. And then God would speak to her. And for years, within six days, as Stan said, people would just, the money would come from directions of people we didn't even know that the Holy Spirit led to give to us and the monies to take care of my family while I was gone and take care of all of my expenses when I traveled were in and paid up front. Now that's my God. and He does that, believe me. He's done it many years for us and uh, we have made it a point. We are a ministry and we do live by faith. And I want you to understand that our testimony in that is before the Lord. He is our provider. You receive a, a prayer letter from us. It isn't full of our needs. You'll never know our needs. The only time we tell our needs is in our prayer closet before the Lord. Now that's ministry. This that you're working with is Prophecy Club. You need to help support it as a club. And Stan clearly says this is a form of a ministry of information, but it's not a church and it's not a work of faith. It's a business. And it's a business you can belong to by being a part of it. But that's different, you understand. And any ministry that works in that realm, I am not in any way passing sentence on. Please understand that. It's just that the Lord has disciplined us in the way that we're not allowed to tell our needs. So I don't look down on someone that sends out prayer letters that tells theirs. Please understand that. But uh, we had the, these intercessors in the, in the meeting. And I was going to give reports, and it would be a confirmation to many of them. And many of them, uh, the wife had notes there of which ones called at different times. So when I was telling experiences or what was to be telling experiences, I would look at them knowing who they are and explain to them, and this is what happened when you were interceding. So they could hear it right from my own lips in a personal way. It was going to be that kind of a meeting, and I say it was going to be, but the Lord had another plan for it. We had uh, everybody brought uh, a hot dish and a salad and a dessert, okay? And it was going to be a dinner at noon, and then we were going to go back and have maybe a couple more hours, and then that would be enough time, we thought. So at 10 o'clock in the morning, we began with prayer, and then I explained that the Lord has given my wife a song that would fit right in. So she began playing her auto harp and singing. As she was singing, the glory of God came down in that room. Now, if you have ever experienced the glory of God, you'll know what I'm saying. But let me explain a little bit if you haven't. When the glory of God comes down, there is an awesomeness that comes over you. There is an awareness of his awesome presence. To some people, it can be a terrible experience because you're physically, spiritually not ready for it. But irregardless... If the glory of God comes down and you are totally not ready for it, you may jump up and run out of the room. But in this case, not one jumped up and ran out. Now, we had many people there that were in their 80s. We had people there that, that couldn't walk real good because of their hips and things like this. But when the glory of God come down, 
I went out of that seat flat on my face. And what I mean by flat on my face on the floor is my nose was touching the floor. And down deep in my innermost being was billowing out of my lips. Holy, holy, holy. I couldn't, I, I could have stopped it, but I didn't want to. His presence was so awesome. That's the only expression I could give that my being felt was adequate for that presence. You understand what I'm saying? And many, the same holy, holy was billowing out of them. And I could tell they hit the deck too, because their voices were coming all around me. In that presence, as that, that awesome presence of his glory came down, and I no more than realized my wife's even stopped singing. She's down beside me. I could hear others crying out. Some were repenting. But as that, I, I, just enough time to recognize that others were on their faces. That's all the time I had. And instantly I was walking on the streets of gold. Now, I was in a totally different realm when there I was right on the streets of gold. Crying holy, I had no idea. I did not petition the Father to, to come to heaven. It was a surprise to me. <laughs> I didn't expect it. But I will never forget the first sensation I experienced. There I was on the streets of gold. It was like I hit the deck running, so to speak, only walking. I came on the street of gold and I started to take a step. And I was looking down, and I saw the street I was on, and I had never seen anything like it. The gold was so pure, it looked transparent. And I was afraid. I actually hesitated with my foot and brought it back and set it down where I had beside the other one. Why did I do that? It was so transparent, I thought if I stepped forward into it, I would sink into it. It was that clear. Then I look at it and I look up the street of gold with this thought. I, I know it's gold, but it's so clear. I wonder if it's clear all the way like this. And I wonder if it turns to more of a gold color as I look up it. So I was looking down. I looked up to look up the pavement of gold that I was standing on. And that's when I laid eyes on a person walking in front of me in white raiment. When I saw that white raiment, I forgot about the street of gold. Now, I can explain to you. I don't know if others have explained to you any detail about the street of gold, the streets of gold. I told you it is, it is crystal clear. The, the street of gold are crystal clear, and yet they have a golden hue to them. And... <laughs> I held up a glass one time. Actually, I saw it on the table and the sun was coming through pretty bright of, of cherry seven up. And there was a kind of a prismatic glow through it from the sun hitting through the window. I picked it up and looked at it in the window like this in the sun. And I thought, Oh my goodness. That is the closest that I can explain that the street of gold looks like. It has, it is a transparent color, a goldish cherry red hue, yet it's transparent. Now, that's the only way I know how to explain the gold. Now, I worked for five years in the city of Phoenix, Arizona at the, at Motorola in the science labs, and I tested metals and uh, in the metallurgical lab. I tested metals for purity. And uh, when I did that, I could tell you what percentage that gold or silver or platinum, copper, uh, brass, what percentage that metal was of purity and what percentage of impurities was in it. Now, I had seen gold that was as fine as my, what hair's left uh, of my hairs. There were gold wires that we used to put in units that went to the first shot to the moon when man walked on the moon that takes it back a few years but uh, i've also worked for a living along with the ministry in life so i haven't worked total faith in the ministry all my life it's consistently the last 17 years 
but intermittently in those previous years of the 30 some years of ministry. But uh, in that understanding of gold, I believe it was because of that understanding that I had to analyze what I was looking at. And this is where it is difficult to explain in earth language what you experience. You understand what I mean? I, I get I get feeling so awkward when I get into try to get into details. I would love to just be able to just pour out detail to you of, of the sensing that I had, the thinking that I had. I can't do it. It we're in a wrong, a different realm here. Uh, it just isn't the same. I can't compare things here that in heaven that are in heaven. It doesn't work. Everything here is so degenerate compared to what is in heaven. Everything in heaven is so pure and perfect. There is nothing in heaven that is impure, imperfect or impure. And so it is difficult to adequately explain these to you. But I want to go on to explaining the robe. When my eyes fell on the robe or the, the white garments that this person was wearing in front of me, I call it a robe because it was one continual flow like a gown. I couldn't tell you if the person in front of me was a man or a woman. That didn't catch any of my attention. It didn't even catch my thoughts. Because what caught my thoughts was the white raiment that that person was wearing. As I looked at that, number one, I had never seen raiment so white. It glistened. It was a lie. It was radiant with whiteness. It was radiant with purity. It was radiating something from it. It was speaking a message straight to my innermost being. And as I walked and tried to get a little closer, I forgot about the entire environment of heaven watching that garment because that garment was speaking to me. And all of a sudden, I began to realize in looking at the weavings of that garment what it was saying. That white raiment was giving me a complete testimony of every work of righteousness that that person had done in their life. I could literally read every good deed that they did unto the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. Their entire garment gave the whole entire account of the works of righteousness that they had done from the day they became born again. And I, I, I feel inadequate again to explain this portion to you to help you, but I must help you in some way to understand. But I, I feel so he, feeble about it because it, it's difficult for me to talk about this part because I, I want to choke up. It's hard. But I'm going to do the best I can to help you understand this. That garment, as it was speaking the works of righteousness to me, it made me so in love with Jesus. It just filled my heart with such gratitude that everything in me wanted to run into the arms of Jesus and just get lost, telling him I loved him. The works of righteousness so emanated his character, his love, his equipping, his gentleness, his long-suffering, all of his virtues and all of his traits came through in testimony of that person's works of righteousness in a way that made me want to live my life pure, holier, and more righteous than I ever had before. It challenged me to want every second of my life to serve Jesus. And as I was walking and following and looking on this garment, and my heart and my whole being were just swelling with praise, all of a sudden in my peripheral vision along the, the golden pavement, I looked and I saw these beautiful colors and I looked and they were flowers. I have never on the earth, and believe me, I've loved flowers since I was a little boy. I used to plant flowers all over the yard. I would go out and find wild flowers and wait till I got the seeds off of them. I'd come back and put them in daddy's flower gardens and I'd plant those weeds in his flower gardens and they'd come up and dad would say, well, now what are those doing in there? 
And I said, well, I planted them, Dad. And he says, those are weeds. I said, but Daddy, they'll bear, they'll bear pretty flowers. Leave them alone, please. No, I don't want a, a weed garden in my flower gardens. I said, but Daddy, they got pretty colors. He says, they're wild. They're weeds. I don't want them in my flower garden. <laughs> so I have loved flowers since I was a child. As a teenager in my early teens, growing up in, in Arizona, in the hot August time of the year, you don't see many flowers out on the area that we lived in Paradise Valley, north of Phoenix, out in the ranch country. It's just a lot of sagebrush and desert sands and the poor saguaro cactus are shriveling up and the ribs are sticking way out and the barrel cactus look like a, a puny shrunken up sponge in the August hot sun. But I had to fly, find some flowers one day. In, in the service that day, the presence of the Lord was so sweet. And I said, Jesus, I want to find some flowers I've never seen before. And around the house, we had one of these magnifying glasses like this that you have a handle on it. We used to take and put it up to the sun and burn paper with it. You know, kids will do crazy things like that. It's a miracle we didn't burn the house down. But uh, I took that magnifying glass and I went out away from the house into a dry wash. And I went up alongside the bank of the wash where the sand had swept up and was along there. And I got down on my hands and knees and elbows and I got that magnifying glass and I started looking at the sand. Guess what I found? I found little flowers that were no bigger around than a pencil lead. You know what I mean? The lead inside the wood. I found flowers in the desert in August and I was so happy. And they were beautiful little flowers. I went home telling everybody about finding these flowers with a magnifying glass. My brothers, they weren't enthralled at all. They, okay, okay, you know. Well, I love flowers. And if you have a love for something here on the earth, when you get into heaven, you will be drawn to the perfection of beauty of what that is. Do you believe that? You really will. And so I was drawn to these flowers and I'm looking at them and I'm saying, I didn't say it in my, my mouth. I didn't have to speak anything. I said it in my mind. No verbalization was needed. In my thoughts, I said, you are so beautiful. I have never seen such colors and such beautiful flowers and perfect and all oh, your fragrance is as sweet as sweet can be. And I no more than thought that. And on the stems of these flowers where the leaves come out, all of a sudden, the, the leaves started doing this on the stems. All over on those flowers, the leaves were clapping their hands. The faces of those flowers turned away from me and turned another direction. And I heard the sweetest singing coming out of those flowers. They burst forth what I wanted to burst forth of gratitude in watching the, the white raiment. They literally broke loose into the sweetest singing. And I can tell you the words they sang. I'll never forget them. The words were, I'd love to sing it like them, but I don't have the voice. I, I'd sound like a bullfrog in heaven if I tried to sing it right now. My voice is too deep. But they were singing this song. All praise, all glory, and all honor and thanksgiving to the Father for creating us and counting us worthy to serve the redeemed. And as they sing the song, their words turned into like prismatic light. And the prismatic light, I followed it with my eyes. I could watch the light moving. And the light was moving and I watched it with my eyes and followed it as it went up to this hill. And then as I looked over this hill was coming the most beautiful glow. All of heaven where I was had a glow, but that had an extra glow. And instantly when I saw that glow, I knew that it was the throne that I was looking at. It, I didn't see the throne. It was on the other side, but I was seeing the radiation from the throne. And the light that emanated from those flowers as they sang went to the throne. And I was made to understand that all of God's creation, that all of life, when it gives honor and glory, thanksgiving and praise back to the Father for creating it, it is reciprocating from the cycle of life. 
and it is regenerated in that manner. Because as the river of life flows from beneath the throne, so does the essence of all life flow from the throne. So when you give thanks, you are literally being regenerated. You are being recharged. And everything in heaven is regenerated continually in the presence of his glory. So you see the perfection of beauty. You see no degeneration. In the word of God, it says that we are being changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Here a little, there a little, line on line, precept on precept. I know to us, it seems like it's just way too slow. It's not happening fast enough. But you know the reason for that. Please understand, I've asked the Lord the reason for that. And he says, because I would that not one would perish. I am long suffering with mankind. For they have chosen the ways of darkness and the ways of the world. But I have chosen to redeem whosoever. And I will plead with them until I see that the table is overturned and there will be too many lost if I allow it to go any farther. Then I will have to step in and I will have to intervene and purge the land of the corruption lest everyone is corrupted through it. And this was what I meant a while ago when I asked you if you understood what the scriptures means when the, the Samuel, the prophet, told Saul, utterly slay all men, women, and children, and everything that breathes and moves. The reason he had to do that was because they had become so vile and so corrupt, as I mentioned to you, the measure of, of corruption that is now in our land is is degenerating our nation rapidly. Christianity is one of the 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 slowest moving religions, uh, 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 growing religions on the face of the earth. Islam is growing right now ten times faster than Christianity. All of the Eastern religions are growing very rapidly as people enter into all these different types of New Age thinking. Lord, help us. But back to heaven. I again was so filled, I couldn't hold it anymore. It's like I was filled to the brim with, with thanksgiving to the Father and gratitude for all the work that he had done in this person's life and for his, all of his attributes being portrayed in the testimonies of that fine linen. I was filled enough then when I felt I was ready to, to boil over or pour over. And then when I saw these flowers doing this, that did it. And I couldn't help it. I turned toward the throne and all of this began to come out of me in a song. And I too joined in, but I sang the song of the redeemed. And I could sing the song of the redeemed from the deep. The song literally came from down deep in the inner recesses of my being. None of the song came from between my ears or the top of my head. It came down from my innermost being. My ears heard it. And my ears, it's like they said to me, yes, 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 that's right. Keep it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what he's worthy of. Yes. My faculties that could understand was in total agreement with what was coming forth from me. It was in perfect harmony with what I had seen in the fine linen and had seen in the flowers. I was caught up in doing this when all of a sudden out of my left ear, I heard more singing. So I turned and I looked to see what was happening. The person that I had been following had stepped off of the pavement of gold. When I looked, I could see two kind of footprints like, and he was heading into the third and fourth step. The blades of grass that he had, his feet had stepped on were singing the same song as the flowers. Every step, the song was louder, but yet it was so sweet and so soft. Never once was anything overbearing in heaven. It stayed in perfect unison and perfect harmony. Yet the grass had a different tone from the flowers. And it's blending in, only blended in to, beauty, to the more beautiful harmony. Now I've worked in, and walked and prayed in the country of Wales for about seven years. I walked every city and village around the entire country of Wales. But you know what? 
I, I, I really appreciated their singing, their acapella singing. They sing five-point harmony acapella. One night I got in the middle of the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church choir, a men's choir, and I sang with those Welshmen. But I'll tell you what, I only started to sing. And when they caught loose and sang, I stood in the middle of them bawling my eyes out. I'd never heard such harmony. Well, that came from the Welsh revival of 1904, 1905. And they still have that song in their hearts. It's still very real. It's still very precious. And it just ministered to me. And I felt so honored standing in the middle of these men. And as they sang and worshiped the Lord, it was so precious. But now I'm looking and it's getting louder and louder in a sense. I, I can't say louder and louder. It's just becoming more significant that more voices are joining in. And it is joining in. The flowers are singing and still clapping their leaves. Now the grass is singing. It wasn't clapping its blades together. It was just the sweetest tone coming out of the grass. And I'm watching, and the same emanation of light is in the song going toward the throne. I saw it going, and it went right toward the throne. Every blade of grass is joining in in this prismatic light that goes toward the throne in worship. And it's, it's just joining more and more, and I'm just rippling with joy. But I have to keep watching because I'm watching this person. And I see that they are going toward a tree such as I have never seen in my life. This tree, and I didn't take time to count the number of different kinds of fruit on it, but it had numerous types of fruit on it that I had never seen the likes of in my life. It was the healthiest leaves. Most beautiful, healthy leaves on the tree, loaded with fruit from top to bottom. And the person walked up to this tree, reached their hand out just like that, right about three to four inches underneath one of these fruits. And the moment the person just opened their hand like that, the fruit very gently dropped into their hand. The tree knew the thoughts of the person, and freely gave of its fruit. Then every leaf on that tree, of that tree, began to clap together. Out of that tree was like a massive choir that filled heaven with music, with the flowers and the grass. And it was like a massive choir in perfect harmony worshiping the Lord, and that tree just swayed like it was in a dance, singing unto the Lord. And you know, in the word of God, it says that the mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. What are their hands? The leaves. All of creation rejoices in the Father. And as I stood doing that again, I couldn't take it anymore. I turned and I had to worship the Lord and I continued to worship the Lord. And then all of a sudden I was back down on the floor, feeling my nose on the floor. My body was wet with perspiration from worshiping the Lord with all of my might. They said that I never stopped crying, holy, holy, holy all the time. That, my wife started singing it just a, a minute or two after 10 o'clock. When I got back up and sit down, saying, I can't begin to tell you what I have just experienced. I looked up at the clock on the wall. Then I looked at my watch. And I said, it can't be. It's not 4.15, is it? And others begin to look at their watches and they said, why, it sure is. How could six hours have gone that quickly? Not one person in that room realized six hours had gone. Not one elderly person wearied of being on their face on the floor. The presence of God was so real and so precious. That's the reason I call it six hours in heaven. Now that has affected me. That has affected me in my walking, in my communion. Since that time, 
I have had, I've been over walking the Middle East. I've had Arab children sick their dogs on me. I've had them come up and jab me in the back with a stick saying, bang, bang, dead. Why would they do that? Because they teach them from as they can first understand the language. You kill a Christian, you see your place with Allah in paradise. So that's why they sick their dogs on me. Growing up, I had a terrible fear of dogs because as a little boy, I was knocked down and bitten up a bit by one. But you know, I overcame that through the years. And, and I, I, at that time of the heaven experience, I didn't have a fear of dogs, but I still didn't have a love of them. <laughs> you understand that, don't you? <laughs> after that heaven experience, I'll have to say, for about five days after that, I was walking on my tiptoes. I didn't want to, I, I want to go back. I was not at home here. I was not at home for a minute. I fell in love with the word in a way that I thought I, I thought I already had, but realized I didn't really have that measure of love. You see, you can only love to the measure that you're loved. That's called reciprocating, isn't it? That's called getting your eyes of understanding enlightened. You cannot go beyond the measure of what you have. It doesn't work unless you have a supernatural intervention. And that's important to remember. In John chapter 17, we have a precious expression here. And you must keep in mind, John 16 and 17 are the final intercessions of the Lord on the face of the earth. And so to me, that makes them very precious. I just want to read a portion of this, but listen to the Lord's words. Verse 15. Oh, we got to go 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they're not of the world. Why do you want to be accepted of the world? If Almighty God knows you're not of the world, why do you want to be accepted of the world? Why do you expect those that are dead in trespasses and sins to treat you nice when they haven't even been born again? Don't do it. I'm never surprised when people want to kill me. You are. You shouldn't be. Jesus said himself, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Just last week, week ago yesterday, I was pulling sheep out of the brambles over in Wales, in the United Kingdom. And it amazed me. Some of the sheep I pulled out of the brambles went right back into the brambles. We do that a lot of times. The Lord will deliver us out of our snares and we run right back into them. We got to have a change of heart. We got to keep our eyes on the shepherd. You see what I'm saying? He'll lead us away from the brambles. But look at what he's saying here. Verse 14, I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, all oh, he had to make that truth real to me because I wanted to go right back. I don't want to go back in the brambles. I want to go right back to heaven. But that you should keep them from the evil. Now, this is the intercessions of Jesus. They're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I'm going to make sure my time here, forgive me. Sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is truth. Set them apart to the truth. The word of God is spoken that it washes your mind. It washes you. You are cleansed by the washing of the word. If your mind gets filled with the cares of this world, you may say, that's the hardest time for me to read the word of God, Henry. I just can't keep my mind on it. You know what I do? I show the enemy, and I've done this for years. I refuse to be interrupted. I have said in my heart, I will read so many chapters. I am going to read them if I'm late for my appointment, if I'm late for whatever, or if I don't get any sleep tonight. You want to keep interrupting me with your thoughts. I'll start back in verse one again. 
You do that consistently. And I want to tell you something. When you really set your heart to crawl in between these covers and snug in, and you're going to stay in there until the presence of God is on you, and you can consistently read one verse after the other without interruption, he'll leave you alone. Because he realizes he is losing ground, and you are really getting grounded in the Word. See the difference? All right, let's read on. Verse 17. Set them apart through thy truth, for thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Or I set myself apart. That's what sanctified means, doesn't it? Verse 8, uh, 19, verse 20, sorry. Neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you and I. That's right up to date today, right now, and those that will believe through your testimony and mine. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be made one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Do you believe that? Verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Oh my goodness. Did you hear what that said? The glory which you gave me, I have given them. Why? That they may be one as we are. Oh, people, please get that word right there. That verse is so vital for the church today. If you are the Ephesians 527 church, that is speaking directly to you in a message that you must not ignore. You are the glorious church, neither having spot nor wrinkle. Is that the Ephesians 527 church? It is. What is the purpose of that? That you may be one. As we are one, what does that mean? Let nothing, I mean nothing, come between you, your brother, and your sister in Christ. Let nothing determine in your heart that you will let nothing destroy you of fellowship one with another. Why? Because the word of God clearly says, if we have fellowship one with another, then the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from a double L. How much is all? All sin. Fellowship is so important. Fellowship is so important. Fellowship, Hebron in the Hebrew. And that's the first place that David ruled over as king of Israel when he ruled over Judah. Now they have given Hebron to the Palestinians. They have given away fellowship. Church, I say to you, do not give away fellowship. Settle it in your heart that no doctrine outside of the basic fundamental doctrine of Jesus Christ, no doctrine will separate you from fellowship from your brother and your sister. And I'm talking even the doctrine of pre, mid, or post rapture. The Lord told me to tell his church, I will hold you accountable for every soul and every lamb that is trampled for you arguing over when. The issue, he said, I never once, show me anywhere in my word, he said to me, show me anywhere in my word where I told you to set concerned with when, not arguing. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees had it all figured out, even to the resurrection. And they separated fellowship if they were not agreed with. And the very Messiah himself walked right down the street with them. They argued with him and they didn't even recognize it was the Messiah. And the Lord has told me that his body of believers will do identically the same thing if they continue to split hairs over when. That we must stop it. That his intercessions are not that we understand all these things. Those things belong to the Lord. Is there anybody here can tell me? The moment, the second, the hour when he will come. No, you can't. So therefore, that is the Deuteronomy 29, 29 category. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. Leave them alone. Don't argue over them. That is not the issue of when. The issue is 
be ready. Now we've got to go on. Look at this. Here's the reason, verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one as we are one, I and them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. The, the body of Christ, the glorious church, will not be made perfect until she is one. And the only way you will be one and stay out of the brambles is keep your eyes on the shepherd. Don't tell the shepherd you love him if you don't love your brothers whom you can see. He's already warned us about that. That they may be one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So the message that is given here is that he has given his glory. His glory will come down. His glory comes down that you and I may be made one, that the world may know that Jesus was sent into the world. You understand that? Now, in closing, I want to give to you some understanding in scriptures about white raiment, just so that you see that white raiment is in the scriptures and it's very important. Beginning with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. It begins with three words that I question you. For we know, the question I have to you is, do you know how important white raiment is? Do you long and desire and hunger to be clothed upon with white raiment? That's what this says. For we know that if this earthly tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. When in that accident I died, I had a body. It couldn't be destroyed. It was more of a body out of this body than it is in this body. Verse 2, for in this we groan earnestly. Do we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven? That's what this says. It says we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Do you groan? Have you groaned to be clothed upon? If you are not living a fruitful life, you must begin to groan. Because I already read to you, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You must be clothed upon. Verse 3, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Oh, that is precious words. That expresses the understanding of our clothing in heaven. We are getting ready. The song is, come on, heaven's children. The city is in sight. Do you believe it? It's time to get clothed on and get ready and be in white raiment and be prepared to go to that city. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, watch. He says, I'm coming for those that are looking for me, right? Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and that keepeth his garments. How much time do you think about keeping your garments? Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. All oh, this is a plea from heaven out of the book of Revelation, out of Corinthians, back to chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. When I went to heaven, the first thing I noticed was the gold. It was transparent. Everything in heaven, the flowers, the grass, the trees, it's as though they are so pure you could see through them, and yet you can see them. I don't know how to explain that, all right? That's all I can say. It, it's as though they're so pure, you can see through them, and yet you can see them. That's purity. It's called transparency. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And then Revelation 19, verse 8, and to her, and I've quoted this to you tonight, but I stopped short of reading it in the beginning. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, 
clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And I want to close out of Revelation chapter 7 and read to you this great wonder in heaven and show to you that white raiment plays a very vital role of this great spectacle in heaven. Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 9. Now, this is after 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes are sealed, right? That's after the 144,000. Look at this, verse 9. It's not a new paragraph. It just simply says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. When was the previous time they stood with palms in their hands? When Jesus entered Jerusalem, wasn't it? And now here they are in heaven, reflecting in purity that which they, re they gave forth on earth when he was there. Verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever Amen, which amen means even so, let it be. Hallelujah. And then verse 13, look at this one. What is an elder? Is an elder someone there because they've been there a long time? You don't get to be an elder overnight, do you? You get to be an elder because you've gained that notoriety, that position of level. Because you've been there, you're seasoned in that environment. I believe this elder had seen perhaps hundreds of thousands of homecomings. Glorious saints coming home. But now all of a sudden this elder sees this and look at his response. He's, you can tell he's never seen this one before by what he says. One of the elders answered saying unto me, what are these? Why does he say, what are these? You ever think about that? Why doesn't he say, who are these? <laughs> Look at his, his, his description of them. What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And have from whence did they come? Where did they come from? That means they've never been in heaven before, doesn't it? All of a sudden, a multitude that no man could number from every nation, kindred, and tongue is come up before the throne and are worshiping God in white robes. I believe that what we're looking at there is in very possibly the glorious church homecoming. And why is it called glorious? The Ephesians 5.27 church. It's called glorious because... It is without spot or wrinkle. And the word glorious means bright and shining and apparent as the noonday sun. Think about that. That means out in the open, doesn't it? Is your life out in the open? Is the world saying about you when you meet another Christian? Look how they love one another. That's what they said about Jesus and his disciples. So it's possible for you and me. We need to begin to get excited when we see fellow brothers and sisters. We need to begin to take on that character. We need to begin to take on that nature more and more. I want you to think with me for a moment. A few years ago, a tape was being circulated around. It was called the Angelic Praise Tape. Some of you may have heard that. It was taped by an individual that had purchased a very small handheld recorder took it to his choir practice that was going to be practicing in a cappella. The only thing they had in that church was an organ. No instruments other than an organ. No one was playing the organ. They would be singing these songs 
a cappella, which means no accompaniment of instruments. He popped on his new recorder, wanting to use it. You know, you would too in those days when those new recorders come out, you want to use them. What better than take it to a choir practice so you can take it home and see how you sound. Your voice is the closest to it so you can tell how you're sounding. But when he got home, rewound it and played it, the choir began to practice and all of a sudden it was overridden by myriads of voices, French horns, harps, all manner of instruments. The first time I heard it, the, the, again, the, the, the tears just shot out of my eyes. My son, who at that time, our eldest son, was getting kind of hardened. He had, we went through a church, we'd been going to a church and there was a split and he really got hurt. I took it to him and I said, why don't you put the headphones on and listen to this. That young man sit there and started bawling his eyes out and repenting. He said, that's real, that's real, that's real. But you know, there were so many singing, I could just barely distinguish a, a tenor voice in there, but I couldn't understand what the tenor voice was singing. And I got so hungry to hear it, and I'd driven down to Arizona to minister. And here I was back at the same parking lot of this Baptist church again. I just realized that now there seems to be a significance about that Skyway Baptist church near Luke Air Force Base. I was sitting in the parking lot waiting for some pastors to come. We were going to have a prayer meeting. And I, I was so hungry by then. I said, Lord, I want to know what that tenor voice is saying. Singing, I can't understand the words. Will you let me just... Focus in beyond all those in those voices and all those instruments. Let me just hear that tenor voice. I put it in real clear. It was like he was singing a solo. And you know what the words were? Hallelujahs ringing all across the land. All the people singing at the Lord's command. And then all of a sudden I hear an intercession like it's coming from the earth up into heaven. And it's a woman's voice and she's weeping and she's travailing and she's crying out. And I hear this travail coming up and interrupting this tenor's voice. And this woman's travail is coming through to heaven and it's saying these words. Oh, Lord, help us to come out of our carnality with eyes only for this world to work from the light of heaven to redeem the time in every land so the harvest can come in. And oh, I tell you, I sit there when those pastors arrived. I not only was sitting in the car, but I was down on the floorboard, my knees on the floorboard, and I was crying out to God and saying, oh God, help me every day of my life to work from the light of heaven. Help me to have a fervent love for your church wherever I find her. I've found his church up in the frozen wastes of Siberia. I've loved his people in Siberia. I've loved them in the northernmost Eskimo villages on the Arctic Ocean. I've loved them on the desert sands of the Middle East. I've loved them over along the waterways and along the lands of Europe, in Eastern and Western Europe from Portugal and where the Atlantic meets the Mediterranean. I've loved them in Algiers and over Morocco. I've loved them in places where I've found them. I've loved them in Egypt. I found God's people all over over the earth, but oftentimes just little bitty handfuls. But oh, I tell you, we need to love one another. We need to settle in our heart that if we find sin in a brother or a sister, we will fulfill the, the, the plan that God gave us through the Apostle Paul in Corinthians. If any of you, does that include some of us, part of us, any of us or all of us? It includes all of us, doesn't it? If any of you see a brother or a sister overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, go and restore such an one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Do you see what I'm saying? Lest you also be tempted. Oh, I tell you, if I can leave any message with you, it's this. Remember the Lord's Prayer. And I pray that every time you hear the Lord's Prayer, that you will remember these words that Jesus, Jesus taught us to pray. 
our Father. So we address our Father. You've heard me talking to the Father a lot. My communion with the Father is sweet and precious. I long for the day when as part of the bride, I will know the Father so well. I will look at him and he will look at me and we will smile at one another as we walk down that aisle. And the bride is arrayed in white raiment with a train that fills the aisle because the Lamb of God is worthy to have a bride. A bride that has a train that fills the aisle. Because Isaiah saw him high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. He is worthy to have a bride that fills the aisle. You see what I'm saying? He is worthy. I long that we, each one of us, would be so filled with the works of righteousness. That the word will begin to be fulfilled here on the earth. Before we get to heaven. The word of his prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you and thank you.